Well, we're going to get into God's Word this morning. Two weeks ago, we launched into this series on the end times called When Christ Returns. Now, my goal in this series is not to, you know, tickle your ears or to fascinate you. My goal in this series is to better equip you for the challenges that we face in this life. I want your faith to be built up so that when you are thinking about the future, you're thinking from a perspective of faith and not fear, right? Because when you really understand what the Word of God has to say about the end times and understand that God has a plan, that He's working, that things are not just, you know, they look chaotic, but the reality is God's always at work, amen? God's always at work, and nothing is going to change the plan of God. And so this, this builds encouragement and faith into our lives. And with everything that we see happening in the world around us, it's easier and easier to see that the second coming of Jesus could be very close at hand. For example, one of the things that we're seeing in our world for a variety of reasons is that we are being positioned for the entrance of a one-world dictator that the Bible refers to as the Antichrist. Now, when the Bible was written and when these prophecies were first written, it would have been impossible, really, for people to imagine a day when one person would be able to rule the entire world. But fast forward to 2021, and now it seems absolutely feasible. With increase in efficiency and travel, the world has just become a smaller place. With an the advancements that we see in technology and communications uh, with the internet and all of these things, it gets more and more feasible to say, yes, someone actually could come into a place of global dominance. Add to that the fact that we have an ever-increasing movement in our world toward globalism, global banking, global commerce, global rec. Uh, regulations. So all of this will eventually lead to a global one world government led by the Antichrist. Now, the word Antichrist is actually only found four times in the New Testament. We can tell a lot about who the Antichrist is just by that one word, that he is anti-Jesus. He's against Jesus. He stands in opposition to everything that Jesus stands for. And while the name Antichrist is only found in these four places in the New Testament, the Antichrist is actually referred to by different names and different titles in many places in the Bible. For example, in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 23, the Antichrist is called a fierce king. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 23, he's also referred to as the master of intrigue. In Daniel 9, 23, the Antichrist is called the prince who is to come. In Daniel eleven twenty one, he's called a despicable man. In Zechariah 11, he's referred to as a worthless shepherd. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, the Antichrist is called the one who brings destruction. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, he's called the lawless one. And then probably most commonly in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, he's referred to as the beast. So if you've been trying to figure out the difference between the Antichrist and the beast, there's no difference. It's the same person, all right? So the Antichrist, um, the Bible doesn't tell us who he is by name, all right? So I'm not going to give you my top five list this morning. Why? Because the Bible doesn't do that. But while the Bible doesn't give us the name of the Antichrist, the Bible actually tells us a lot about 
the Antichrist. So I want to share some of the characteristics that the Bible shares with us about who the Antichrist is, all right? First of all, we need to know that he will be a charismatic leader. He's going to be a person full of charisma. He's not going to arrive on the scene and say, da-da, I'm the Antichrist, follow me. No, he's going he's gonna to be charismatic. People are going to be drawn to him. Uh, he's going to be a skilled orator. He's going to be a very smooth talker. And uh, people are actually going to be attracted to him so much so that even the nation of Israel is going to enter into a covenant with him. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5 says, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies. Revelation 13, 8 says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. So he's going he's gonna to be charismatic. He's going to have a magnetic personality. It's not going to be, uh, you know, so apparent that this is the Antichrist at first. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 20 says that he had a mouth that spoke boastfully. All right, so there's, there's charisma, there's leadership. So he's going to be a charismatic leader. Secondly, he will also be a cunning leader, a cunning leader. He's going to be underhanded and sly. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8 uh, says this in the middle of this incredible apocalyptic dream that God gave to Daniel. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, so this is the Antichrist, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, in apocalyptic literature, which a big portion of the book of Daniel is, and most of the book of Revelation is. It's apocalyptic literature. In apocalyptic literature, uh, symbolic numbers and symbolic images are often used. In Old Testament times, in several places, this, this image of a horn represented someone who is in power. So in this vision that God gave to Daniel, there's these three horns, and they are supplanted by one inferior horn. In other words, this suggests that even though the Antichrist doesn't initially have as much power as these other leaders, he was able to take their place, to supplant them through deception and through being cunning and possibly even having them assassinated. Okay? Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 23 says, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. Now, I'm not going to go this into this entire vision, but God gives uh, Daniel a vision where he sees four different beasts. Each one of these beasts represents a different empire. When you get to this fourth beast, it represents the Roman Empire. And it says, it will be different from all the other kingdoms. And it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. See, up till that time, the Roman Empire was more powerful than any empire that had come before it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come up from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High. This is the Antichrist and oppress his holy people, and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. So God gives this vision to Daniel. It involves these four beasts. These four beasts represent four major empires in world history. This fourth beast that devoured the whole earth is the Roman Empire, but then there are ten kings that later on rise up out of the Roman Empire. This is most likely a unified European League of Nations. And then the Antichrist comes on the scene. It's very likely that the Antichrist will arise as a leader of this revived Roman Empire. He's going to be a person of un paralleled political power. 
So he's going to be a very cunning leader. A third thing that we should know about the Antichrist is that he will be a cultic leader. There's going to be a religious aspect to the Antichrist. Why? Because he doesn't only want to control the world, he wants to control people's hearts and minds. He seeks to be worshipped because he has the spirit of Satan who wants to be worshipped. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, He will oppose himself and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So there's going to be this religious aspect to the Antichrist. And by the way, this lets us know that it's extremely unlikely that the Antichrist will be a Muslim because the Muslim mantra is that there is no God but Allah. So they're not about to start worshiping some other God. So in all likelihood, the Antichrist will not be a Muslim, but he will seek to be worshiped by people in the world. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4 says people worshiped the dragon. Now, in this case, the dragon is a symbol of Satan, okay? So people in the end times will actually become Satan worshipers because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? So this leader is going to have incredible, incredible power. And by the way, there's another end times figure as we're talking about this that we should mention uh, because he is the religious cohort of the Antichrist and he is what we call the false prophet. Revelation chapter 13 in verse 11 talks about the false prophet. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. And then it goes on to say, and it performed, this is the false prophet, it performed great signs, all right? So incredible miracles, signs and wonders. It performed great signs even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So the Antichrist is going to be a cultic, a cultic leader. And then a fourth thing. Make no mistake about it, the Antichrist will be a cruel leader. A cruel leader. He will start off as a man of peace, but he will quickly turn to a man of war and violence. If you look back in world history, one of the things that you'll see about pretty much every dictator is that that dictator would galvanize the people around a common enemy. And it could be a group of people, a couple of groups of people, but a certain type of people. And he would blame these people and say, these people are the problem. And he would galvanize, he, they galvanize the nation against these people. For Nero, he galvanized the Roman Empire against the Christians. In the case of Hitler, of course, he galvanized the German people against the Jews. And in the same vein, the Antichrist will galvanize the people of the world against Christians and the Jews, against the nation of Israel. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 says, He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people. So this is the nation of Israel that the Antichrist will make a covenant with, but then break that covenant and come against them. 
Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast because it's Mark in verse 4 on their forehand, uh, foreheads or hands. Now this is referring to the time of the great tribulation. And I believe this shows us that during the tribulation, some people will become Christians but they will suffer great persecution because of their decision to follow Jesus. So if, by the way, you're the kind of person that's been thinking, well, I'm not going to get saved yet. I'm going to wait and I'm just going to live however I want to. And then after Jesus comes back in the tribulation time, then I'm going to get saved. Listen, I hope you're not thinking that way. So you don't have the courage to follow Jesus now. You're not going to have the courage to follow Jesus then. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to give your life to Jesus Christ. Be ready for his coming, right? He's going to be a cruel leader. Now, what is the Antichrist going to do? I mean, what's his program? What's his plan? Well, the Bible tells us these things. The Antichrist is going to do many things, but I want to share with you three specific things that are part of the Antichrist program according to the Bible. First, the first thing he's going to do is he will establish a one-world economy and monetary system. A one-world economy and monetary system. Revelation 13 says, verse 16, It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had that mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Listen to that. The number of a man. That number is 666. Six. By the way, this scripture for me is yet another proof of how amazing and anointing, anointed rather, the Bible really is. Revelation was written before 100 AD. I mean, this is Roman times. This is, you know, chariots and togas. And this, this is 1,300 years before the first printing press. This is, this is long before electricity and computers and microchips and electronic banking and the internet and all the rest. What I'm saying is, in the time that this was first written, they would have never been in their wildest dreams imagined a worldwide system where people couldn't buy and sell anything without this mark. And yet God knew it, and he told us 2,000 years ago. It would have been impossible to conceive back then. But here we are, 2,000 years later, and it's easy to see. It's all, the technology's already there, isn't it? Everything's already in place. Now, the number 666 itself is probably a symbolic number. Seven being the perfect number, the number of God. The Bible says here that... The number six is symbolic of man. It's the number of man. So why three times? Probably representative of the unholy trinity. Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Six, six, six. So when a person takes the mark of the beast, they're pledging an allegiance to the Antichrist. All right, now, I'm going to answer a question. Might be a little controversial for some of you. This has been the most asked question that I've received in the last six months. What about the vaccine? Is the vaccine the mark of the beast? Okay. Now listen, there's a lot of controversy about the vaccine in general, and I'm not here to say get the vaccine, don't get the vaccine. You decide that between you and God and your doctor and your spouse, right? Right? But is the vaccine actually the mark of the beast? And I can tell you with great biblical confidence today that absolutely it is not the mark of the beast. Well, how do you know that, Pastor Tim? 
Well, first of all, when someone receives the real mark of the beast, it's not going to be by accident. They're going to know what they're doing. They're going to know it full well. In fact, it says that they, they received the mark of the beast and they worshipped his image. So when someone gets the mark of the beast, it's not an accident. It's a decision they make and they align themselves with the beast and those who refuse to do so are going to be beheaded. Okay? Now, is there pressure being put on people to get the vaccine? Yes, but I haven't heard of anybody getting beheaded yet over it. Another reason I believe it's impossible that this vaccine is the mark of the beast is because that would mean that people are mistakenly losing their salvation. And that's an impossible thing to do. You can't lose your salvation by mistake. You can't have your salvation stolen from you. Jesus said of his disciples, no one can snatch them out of my hand. So you can't have your salvation stolen. You can't walk into your dentist office, a follower of Jesus Christ, and then get put under and have a chip put into you, and then you walk out and you're not saved anymore and going to hell. It's not how God works. So people aren't going to accidentally or mistakenly get the mark of the beast. It's going to be a decision that people make, and they're going to know what they're doing. Okay? And I hope, that, I hope that helps you. You might think, well, what does it matter if that rumor's out there? Listen, we've got a lot of people in our church that have already received the vaccine. I don't want other members of our church walking around saying they got the mark of the beast. It doesn't exactly create church unity. <laughs> so this is one of the programs of the Antichrist to create this world global monetary system. And by the way, while I've said all about that about the vaccine, I want you to remember, though, everything is in place for the day that that is going to happen. Right? I mean, it's all there. It's all there. Second thing the Antichrist is going to do is he will bring temporary peace, temporary peace to the Middle East, and then break that covenant of peace. One of the things that is going to attract people to the Antichrist is he's going to solve a world problem that has existed for centuries. Peace in the Middle East. And the Bible teaches us that Israel is actually going to enter into a pact with the Antichrist, but after three and a half years, halfway through the tribulation, that pact is going to be broken. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That's a seven-year period. Sounds like tr the tribulation, right? For one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desola desolation. This is, he's going to set up his own image in the temple of God in Jerusalem until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So at some point, the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the sacrificial system reestablished. This is why we always pay attention to what's happening in Israel. But the Antichrist will then come against Israel and not only put an end to the sacrificial system and their practices, but he will set up an image of himself in the temple. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 says, He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. So if a time is a year, one year, plus two years, plus a half a year, is how many years? Three and a half years. All right? one half of the period of the seven years of tribulation. Okay? Third thing on the Antichrist program, he will unite the nations of the world against God. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 23, in the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely 
wicked. A fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. This is the nation of Israel. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princesses. Yet, he will be destroyed. He will be destroyed, but not by human power. Amen? Yeah. We don't have to worry about taking down the Antichrist. God's going to do that for us. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And that brings us to our our next point, and this is something I really want you to understand today. And this is going to help you not to live in fear. We need to know that the Antichrist will have limited power. The Antichrist will have limited power. He will only be allowed to do what God determines he will do. Okay? So, the Antichrist will only be able to do what God allows. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5 again. The beast was given a mouth. He was what? He was given a mouth. He was given a mouth. He was allowed to have a mouth. He was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. So there's a set time. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power. It was what? It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. It was given authority. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So God is going to allow the Antichrist Christ to go so far and not one step further, right? Because even the Antichrist is nothing more than a pawn in God's plan, right? Yeah. Number two, the Antichrist will not come into power until God allows it to happen, okay? Everything, church, is going to be on God's timetable, not man's, right? And and even the appearance of the Antichrist is not going to happen until God allows the Antichrist to appear on the scene. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, And now you know what is holding him back. This is talking about the Antichrist in context. You know what's holding him back. He's being held back. So that he may be revealed, when? At the proper time. When God says, that's when it's going to happen. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. So there's one who holds back the revealing of the Antichrist right now. And I believe that's the Holy Spirit. There's no person that has that kind of power and authority. It's only the Spirit of God. And it says, when it's time, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. And by the way, church, that's why I believe we won't be going through the tribulation. I believe we will be here to see the revealing of the Antichrist at the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. But then we're going to be taken out of this world. Why do I think that? Hey, if the Holy Spirit's going, I'm going. Yeah, and then, and only then, the lawless one will be revealed. So the appearance of the Antichrist marks the beginning of the tribulation period, and this is not going to happen until God determines that it's going to happen, okay? Yes, and then lastly, know this, the Antichrist will be destroyed in an instant, by a single word from God. It's God who's going to take him out. And it, it's not going to be hard for God to do it. When God says the word, it's over for the Antichrist. 
it's over like that. I want to um, take a moment now. We've talked about the Antichrist a lot, and I want to talk about something a lot better. Let's talk about Christ. At the end of the Antichrist reign, Jesus is going to come in person and destroy the Antichrist. And in the book of Revelation in 19, we have this incredible, incredible revelation of Jesus' return. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Ha, ha, ha. Remember when Jesus, and we just talked about this a few weeks ago, when Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time on Palm Sunday, he was riding what? A donkey. Not very glamorous. Listen, when Jesus comes back, he ain't going to be riding no donkey. He's going to be riding a powerful white horse. Now, in Roman times, the white horse in the victory procession, the white horse was reserved for the victorious general. And when Jesus comes back, he's coming back in victory. Amen? Yeah. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows, but he himself, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. We're just going to pause right there. He's riding on a white horse. His eyes, the Bible says, are like blazing fire. In other words, there's nothing that is hidden from God's sight. Everything is known to the Lord. Everything, everything that is now hidden and secret is going to be revealed and made known by God. Nothing will hide from him. And because of that, Jesus is from him is qualified to be the judge of the world. We know in part, Jesus knows everything perfectly. His eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head, not just one crown, are many crowns. In other words, Jesus comes to rule and reign over all things for all eternity. There is nothing that will not be subject to Jesus. On his head are many crowns. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and I believe that this blood on this white robe is symbolic of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. It's through his blood, church, that we have victory today and tomorrow and forever. Yes. Verse 14 says, The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. Woo! Come on, we get white horses too. <laughs> white and clean, coming out of his mouth. This is a kind of a you know really frightening picture. Coming out of the mouth of Jesus is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. In other words, to have victory, all Jesus has to do is speak the word. All he has to do is say it. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Come on, someone shout praise. Someone shout praise. Shout praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. So that day is coming. That day is coming. But what do we do now as believers? How do we prepare ourselves. Now, as I've shared, I, I believe we're actually, going at, we're actually going to be gone before the majority of what I said this morning is going to happen. On the other hand, this stuff doesn't just get into place overnight, right? We, we see these things being brought into place right now. About a year ago, I started asking myself, why are some of our politicians not only allowing Rioting and violence, they're actually encouraging it. Why are our leaders, why, why do they seem to be in favor of chaos and disorder? 
Well, I'll give you the short answer. Where there's chaos and disorder, people get fearful. And when people get fearful, they give up their rights. And they let other people rule over them. So someone can show up and say, here I am, let me be in charge, I will take care of everything. Right? So it's a setup. It's a setup. It's paving the way. Paving the way. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18 says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. But then watch this. Even now, many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. So in other words, the spirit of antichrist has been at work in our world for the last 2,000 years. And we are seeing an increase and an increase in the spirit and influence of antichrist, anti-God, in our world, right? To the point where to say anything against what we're being told is real. When we know their lies, to come against lies, to tell the truth will get you canceled. We must stand for the truth, church. Amen? So the spirit of Antichrist is already. So how do we get ready? How do we get ready? All right? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what we don't do. We don't shrink back in fear. Amen? Amen? Not going to shrink back in fear. We're not going to give in to fear. Okay? So what, what do we do? How do we, how do we get ready? Well, it starts right here. Receive Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that yet, that's the first step. In fact, I'm going to say without Jesus, I don't know who's going to help you. If you're going to try to do this without Jesus, I don't, I don't even know what to tell you. Because your money's not going to save you. Your parents aren't going to save you. Your church isn't going to save you. The only one we can rely on is Jesus himself. Amen? He's the one. He's the one that we build our lives on. So we start right there. Secondly, guard your heart and mind with the word of God. Guard your heart and mind with the word of God. The only way to tell truth from a lie is to know the truth, to know it well. That's how you tell what's real from what is counterfeit. Several years ago for my birthday, I received a bunch of, bunch of money from people. It was my 40th birthday, and I, people knew I wanted to get this camera, all right? Dates me, I know, back then, didn't have a camera on my phone. Kids, we used to have a separate device. A whole other thing to take pictures with. So I really, I had, I had my, my heart set on this particular camera. $450 came in for me. I had four $100 bills, a $50 bill. I marched myself down to the photo store, the camera store at the mall, the Rogue Valley Mall. At the time, I walk in, I buy my camera, man, I am so excited. Until later that afternoon, I get a call from the store telling me that two of the $100 bills I had given them were counterfeit $100 bills. And by the way, just so you know, if you haven't experienced that, the store doesn't take the loss. I had to come back and bring my camera back. Yes. $200 bills that I had gotten from somebody. <laughs> no, 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 it was nobody here. It was actually one of my relatives. <laughs> but these $100 bills, they look like the real deal to me. I mean, they didn't look any different from any other $100 bill I'd ever seen. But the reality is, I haven't studied. I haven't trained. I don't know exactly what a $100 bill is supposed to look like. You know, they got all those marks now, and they got, a, you know, they got all these ways to tell a counterfeit from a real $100 bill. I didn't know any of that. 
But the person at the store, you know, after I left, they held it up to the light and went, aha, that's not real. Listen, the point is, if you want to know the counterfeit from the real, you got to know the real. Get the word of God into your heart and get the word of God into your mind and test everything by the truth of God's word. Number three, if you want to be ready, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does so much for us. The Holy Spirit gives us power. The Holy Spirit gives us courage. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. But one of the things that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do is Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. And Jesus told his disciples in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So be as full of the Holy Spirit as you can get. And then number four, surround yourself with godly people. Surround yourself with godly people. Listen, church, we need our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need the church like never before. Now is not a time to withdraw from church, now is a time to be closer than ever. Amen? Amen? We need the body of Christ. We need one another. I thank God for people in my life over the years that have spoken in my life exactly what I needed, when I needed it. Yes, God speaks to me. Yes, I've got the word. But for some reason, I wasn't hearing so clearly as I should from God at the moment. And someone had to come and say, Tim, I want you to think about something. Tim, think about this. And I thank God for people in my life that have brought a level of accountability to me. Amen? And we all need it. Surround yourself with godly people. And then number five, and this is for you parents and grandparents, prepare your children. Get them ready. Prepare your children to be able to take a stand for Christ. Listen, guys, our kids, they're being bombarded. They're being bombarded with every lie of the enemy. Their little hearts, their little minds. Now listen, I thank God for godly educators, and we have a lot of them. A lot of them that attend church here at Bethel. I thank God for godly administrators in the school system, for godly teachers, for we need them there. So I'm not talking about everybody in the school system. I'm saying in general, there's this incredible push and pressure that's coming into every single school district to comply with these mandates coming from the government about what we're supposed to be teaching our kids, even at very young ages, and it's brainwashing them. Amen. It's literally parents, make yourself aware of what your kids are being taught in school because the agenda... The agenda is no longer math and science and history. The agenda is to shape who they are and shape who they're thinking and shape what they love. Come on. Parents, be aware. Educate yourself. Know what's being taught in school and equip your kids. Pray for your kids. Teach your kids the word of God. Get them into Sunday school. You can't overdo it. Let the kids know the, what the word of God has to say and pray that they're filled and powered with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Our kids, yeah. The Holy, the Holy Spirit isn't reserved for 60-year-olds plus. The Holy Spirit is for kids. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. So church, come on. Let's be ready. Let's not move forward in fear, but move forward in faith and confidence in Jesus.